Hi, uh, my name is Tom Bronack, and today I'm going to try to give you a demonstration on how you can utilize dashboards, there's more than one, to improve efficiency and productivity for a, a full range of uh, project types. But today I'm going to concentrate mostly on recovery planning and activation. Uh, you can see my picture, you can see my contact information here, should you want to get in touch with me. So let's go forward. The, uh, the project I just finished was a very long worldwide type of project, and it's a typical type of project today, uh, where you had uh, loss of control because your company was a global, pro a global company, and not all of your data processing and business locations were under your control. Some were outside uh, contractor control, some were leased facilities, and so on. So. In this particular case, the customer wanted to gain control of his environment, and he wanted to do everything from soup to nuts, which was really, really a good, fun type of thing to do. Uh, we started out with a bid. In other words, the customer gave out an RFP, and we bid on it. Then we also produced a statement of work as to what we were going to do, along with a project plan that outlined the scope, the goals, and the time frame for our deliverables. And the project consisted of six phases, which were inventory, since I told you the locations were all over the place. We had to inventory all of the locations, determine the resources. Then we had to build three regional data centers, and I'll show you more about that. Then we had to transition the equipment from its old location to the production data centers, as it was, and prove that it could still work the same way it did before. Once that transition was over, we started to build a recovery data center that would be internal to the company alone. So now there would be four data centers, three production, one recovery. Once we got to the recovery data center, we also wanted to virtualize the environment. So now instead of having one application in one server, we had multiple applications in a specific server and they were all VM machines. So once we virtualize the environment, we had to have a proof of concept that our recovery data center could indeed support the production data center. And then we went forward with disaster recovery projects, which were IT disaster recovery and application certification. And we also had business locations uh, that could have been lost. And we'll go through that again, too. The last phase of the project was compliance. And, and we had to adhere to the laws and regulations of all of the countries that we did business in. So that was the compliance aspect. Well, the management of the project had these goals. Right? It was a global project and many phases. There are many people involved. There are many documents involved, as you can see. All of the work was done basically through conference calls and remote meetings. Current and accurate data was a big problem. Coordination and control became absolutely hard because the data was out of sync. Status reporting uh, was difficult to say the least and management was getting pretty upset. And our delivery schedule was slipping and the only way we could solve it is through library management and the use of dashboards and I'll show you how we did that. As you see, we built the three regional data centers. One covered the Americas, the other covered Europe, and last was the Asia-Pacific area. Our goal was to take the original site users and place them into the regional data center that was closest to where they are, or they were assigned to. So we built the three data centers. We became 100% LEED certified in the process, and we optimized the library management and controls to gain better control of the environment. Some of the things we had to do, applications. We developed a global company applications library where we broke applications by region and then the application name, its criticality, and so forth. We had to develop an entirely new system development lifecycle, which I enjoyed. Uh, we also had to build disaster recovery and business continuity plans. We had to perform asset management for acquisition, redeployment, and termination of assets. And then it also included inventory management and configuration management and working with the infrastructure staff to make sure products were installed. 
we had a large number of projects, all of them going on at different times. So the project management office had to have tracking for all of the projects, and the, the dashboard was the key to success in that area as well. And of course, we had to play, uh, provide training to everybody. Now, why did I develop the dashboard? Well, all the projects were slipping, their schedules, the productivity was lost, everything was just getting crazy. There was too much time spent in conference calls and remote meetings when people did not have the right data in front of them. They had uh, a version and release that was weeks out of date, so it was just going crazy. Confusion was rampant, chaos. People were just not being able to make the delivery schedules. Management was getting very upset because they were not receiving straight answers and could not examine project data directly. Costs were out of hand. Workflow tracking was impossible. There was no way to improve efficiency following our current path. So the company and its reputation were in great peril because the final goal of having a virtual environment that could recover all tiers of applications was nowhere in sight. Well, I saw the dashboard as a tool I could use to help the client succeed better. <coughs> How I did that was I created all I created libraries that contained all of the documentation for the projects that we were doing. I called it a repository. I then created a dashboard to front end the information to the people. So if somebody wanted a piece of information, they would go through the dashboard, select it, and you would be guaranteed current and accurate information, and they would work on it. If changes had to be made, they would submit it back through the dashboard, approved, and the data was then sent to the library, again, guaranteeing accurate and current data. This data was viewable from any location at any time. So if you were a manager who woke up in the middle of the night with a nightmare <laughs> and you wanted to find out how your status was, you could go online and find out right away. It reduced the need for many conference calls and remote meetings, and allowed people to continue to do their work instead of sitting in meetings, which improved the efficiency and reduced the cost. Providing a dashboard between people and uh, will ensure the data is accurate. It's you, it was remote. You can view the data remotely during a conference call at any time we want it. We can allow data to be updated as I showed. And you would allow drill down to their current activity for a task being performed and actually find the person doing the task. Now, if you had a product like Link or anything like that, you could simply click on the person's uh, name and you would get the name, title, phone, email, and even their IM address so you could send them an IM message right away. We did find this to be the most efficient method for coordinating projects and real-time activities. In the process, I also found out that we could take forms, forms being documents with fields in them, and we can make push them through a dashboard and convert them to a database and then store them in a database type of library. Flat files for reports and other types of data could also be front-ended and stored into a data repository. So we call this our library management system. All right, what I talk to you about today. Today I am going to start off by showing you how our executive dashboard can connect to an infrastructure, systems development lifecycle, recovery management, or compliance dashboard. Today we're only going to concentrate on the recovery management dashboard. I'm going to show you how we can do application recovery certification from a DR exercise booklet, but I'm really going to take you through a path for a business recovery plan where a location has to have an evacuation and then try to move to a business recovery site. Anytime you have any plan, problems can arise. Problems are then placed into an action item. The action item is assigned to a person with deliverable dates and actions to be taken. We also copy our contingency command center who are responsible for coordinating all recovery operations within the company and there could be many at any one time. The contingency command center then talks to the emergency operations center who is responsible for trying to maintain the business going forward even during a disaster event. 
the Emergency Operations Center then talks to executive management, and executive management projects a single image to the outside world, including the media, the clients, the employees, the community, the government, and the families of employees and other people who may have been involved with the disaster event. All right, without further ado, let me take you on to show you what the disaster, executive disaster recovery management looks like. The management dashboard, this uh, was built for enterprise resiliency and corporate certification, where enterprise resiliency is the combination of all recovery operations under one umbrella, and corporate certification is to guarantee that the company adheres to all laws and regulations for the companies in which they conduct business, or the countries in which they conduct business. Now, there are seven phases to this. Phase one is management guidelines and goals. Phase two is providing a risk assessment so you can better understand the problems that you faced. Phase three, three is a business impact analysis so you can look at the various locations that you have, find out how many people there are, what the location is, what the infrastructure is, what supplies are required, what clients are being uh, serviced, and what criticality uh, the various services are. That would give you a recovery time objective, recovery point objective. But sometimes we can't make them, so we also judge re recovery time capability. And if your capability doesn't match the requirements, then you know you have improvements to be made. Next, we looked at automated tools because it was a very large project and we felt automated tools would help us. Then we actually created recovery plans. And I'm going to show you these in a second. And then we, in some cases, we had to initiate a recovery plan, either for a test or in this particular case for a real situation. The last part of it was communications. So let's go back to the top and explain what a phase is. Well, each phase has guidelines and each phase is responsible for producing documents. In phase one, the documents that need to be produced are here. Every document you see in green is already produced, but I'm only going to show you some of the documents because uh, you'll get a better understanding of what this is all about. Starting out with a planning session, uh, you have to identify the application. This is where management would get together and determine what type of recovery situation we're going to have and how we're going to initiate it and what our goals are. Uh, in all cases, when you identify an application, you want to know who the contacts are for that application. You have the T DR teams and their organization, applications purpose and criticality, and there are a number of other things that are done. But while this planning session is being conducted, you can also do things in parallel. For example, you can develop an organization chart. You know, what is the recovery organization going to look like? Now, this is a very important thing because the systems management organization is really in charge of uh, implementing the IT service and rolling it out to the business locations and then supporting them going forward. And it's broken into three or four separate categories. The first is resource management because when you have a new project, you're going to need resources. And how do you get that? First thing you have to do is define what my service level requirement is. So you have to manage to that service level. Then you have to talk about what assets do I need. And you have to then put out a request to purchase the asset, have the asset delivered, installed. And then once it's installed, it gets placed into the inventory. It also gets placed into the configuration for the location that it's installed at. Then you have to determine what the capacity and performance is. I just purchase a piece of equipment whose capacity is, let's say, I have 100 gigabytes of storage. I'm only using 70 gigabytes. Is that being used properly? So those guys will be involved with resource management. Then you had the system development lifecycle where you can build an application or maintain an application or a service. Now a service is a group of applications tied together. You can test them. You can do quality assurance. You know, in, a, in the VM world, when you want to do testing, you can take a copy of the production environment, a snapshot of it, 
restore it to a test environment, and actually do your testing against that, that environment, which will better help you ensure that when you get to the production environment, it's going to work. And you can also take the successful operation as a, another piece of documentation that you can give quality control. You can also exercise recovery in that environment as well and give that successful recovery test document to quality assurance. Quality insurance makes sure that all the documentation that is needed is provided and that the version and release management levels are all at the same level. Production acceptance, the next step, and they set up the production environment with the information going forward, and then when it's all set up, it's turned over production and it's run. Reco uh, support management now comes in. So anytime an incident or a problem arises, they fix it. And sometimes a fix has to re has a need to have a change ma made. So change management involved with this as well. Last is recovery management. Business continuity management is executive management's responsibility, and they're chartered to stop business interruptions and to uh, limit the amount of time that an interruption can have to the company's business. Security management is involved as well, both for the IT environment, for the data, and for physical locations. Vital records management deals with the data, making sure that the data is protected. Network deals with safety over the network, bandwidth, and stuff like that. Business recovery deals with your offices. Disaster recovery deals with the IT. And risk management is involved with insurance and making sure that you're not taking unnecessary risk. The system development life cycle looks like this. Data is provided to the, from the end user to the development area. What we do is we make this a work order. And every step of the way is a purchase order. So we have the services and resources used in each of these boxes as a purchase order charged against the work order here. And I'll show you how that's important in a second. We'll go through development, go through testing, both the unit and the system, go through quality assurance, production acceptance, production, and in production, you back up the data like maybe once a day and then do a weekly backup and put it into a vault. You can also do real-time backup for online files, or you could do data synchronization through a recovery point application, and that's what we're going to use. When an end user submits an application for being uh, developed, he also is concerned about his location. So he's going to need a business recovery facility. So if his location is lost due to fire or other natural disaster, he can then go to the business recovery site and then connect to the, to the, uh, the data center again. Also, users sometimes request updates or enhancements, and that can go to change management. And when that's done, a copy of the production environment is brought to change management, the version and release is up by one, and then you go through the process of uh, maintenance, testing, quality assurance, production acceptance, and back into production again, recovering a complete cycle. The work that's done by the people in this environment is listed here. So you can see how the environment works and who does what. A chargeback system based on that work order we talked about before and the purchase orders can be easily maintained by assigning a purchase order to a specific area of work and then putting up the cost of that area and totaling it at the end. This became very important to us because we had a lot of projects that were similar in nature. And at the beginning, we really didn't know how to cost them. As uh, we used this system more and more, we were able to determine the cost better. Finally, we had to develop the Emergency Operations Center. Now, just like in any big city where there's a, a command center uh, or a war room, this is set up the same way. Uh, you would have a room with a bunch of cubicles or chairs, and various people would be manning those chairs, and they would be in charge of sub-areas. For example, the command center's manager would be in charge of the contingent command center, the incident command center, the help desk, operations, and network command center. They would all report activities to him. He would report into the EOC. Certification for uh, law adherence and stuff like that throughout the world would be reported to the corporate certification officer, but we would also have an information security manager on site as well. Workplace violence and uh, 
safety and violence prevention was attached here because we could have had a terrorist operation. Lines of business had to be communicated to. Emergency response people had to be communicated to. Continuity had to be uh, responded to. And the integration of services within the business had to be responded to as well. And that was the ELC. All right. Now, reporting structures were had to be put in place too. So for management, executives, steering committee, and so on, they received reports on a very different time basis or frequency. Their content was different and their format was different. Laws and regulations that had to be adhered to were also made public so that people could understand them. So we had a table of contents that had all the laws and regulations in it so that you can always find out what it is you want and you can jump to any specific area within the document to gain the information you needed. <clears throat> Action items, tracking mechanism was put in place. Uh, technology risk assessment was also uh, put in place so you can see how, how you perform a technology risk assessment. Uh, what it is, when you should do it, what are the benefits you should get, and the approach to doing it. Basically, you have to define your IT universe, audit universe, and then set up a model for doing it. All of these documents now are included in what I offer. And of course, you may have your own, but you can use either one, and it's easy enough to link from one to the other. You can optimize the company infrastructure, which is the operations department. Uh, there's a B, uh, business recovery plan, a statement of work. So this tells you that we're going to be achieving enterprise resiliency and corporate certification. And you can see that the document is, again, viewable, and you can link to any place you want within the document. Now, the most important thing that I'm trying to do is to show you that what we have here is the ability to get the stuff quickly. Here's a planning guide. Now, I developed a planning guide for both the disaster recovery and the business continuity side so that everybody who's being assigned to these projects would have an idea of what's required, what is disaster recovery, what's business continuity, <coughs> how does it apply to the company, including supply chain management. This was a manufacturing firm that we worked for last. Uh, how do we salvage and protect the environment? Uh, now, within all these documents, there are links as well. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Here's a DR exercise book where it's a fill in the blanks type of thing. So you have, uh, this is for application certification, uh, application recovery certification. Again, it's got a table of contents you can jump to any place you want. And if you see yellow, that's where you have to fill something in. So here would be application description, exercise overview, the scope. How do we know if the test was successful? How do we know if the test was not successful and we should cancel it? Again, throughout this document, there are places you can link to and you can get the information you need at your fingertips. It's a lot better than have to go all over the place and search. Oh, there's one more thing I wanted to show you. Uh, at the end of this document, uh, let's just go to appendices. You have your appendices here, and each form that you need is right here. So that you can simply link to the form, fill it in, and get ready to go. Now, this is the application information that can be used for pre-stage. In other words, the recovery environment has a pool of resources that are available for recovery testing and for recovery activation. What you do in the recovery test cycle is you provide them with the information that they need to set up that environment so that they have the resources available for you. What applications, the server information, uh, resources and capacity, 
criticality, security, because you have to have firewall protection at the recovery site, just like you have at the production site. Uh, backup, you take the latest backup tape, you send it over to them. They restore the backup tape at the recovery site, and then they do data synchronization with the recovery point application that's in the recovery site and a recovery point application that's in the production site. That synchronizes your data, and if you have a recovery point of every 15 minutes, then the greatest output, the greatest loss of data could be 15 minutes to the recovery point, and then you can do a continuous data uh, protection by doing a forward recovery of data from the checkpoint or the snapshot to the current time of failure. At that point, uh, your environment can be picked up and continued at the recovery site just like it was at the production site. And you see all this stuff. Again, what I'm trying to show is how quickly we can get to things. Now, uh, all right, this is all the data that you would see. In the this is the types of documents that are produced in phase one. But we also have training material because we have to provide people with the information they need to do their job. So each phase has a training material document associated with it. This is for phase one, and it tells you what we're trying to do. And this is what we're trying to do is build a business plan, and we're trying to understand what the roles and responsibility of everybody is within the company. And we're trying to understand what enterprise resiliency and corporate certification is and how it's structured. Uh, what is a disaster event? What's its life cycle? What's the charter and mission statement that we're trying to build? What goals and objectives? And then finally establishing a business plan and building the recovery process going forward. Again, if you had to search for this data on your own, it would take you a long time. <laughs> Uh, a disaster recovery planning guide I showed you already. Uh, statement of work I showed you. Personnel productivity system I just have to show you this. Uh, the two things that people always need is training and a job. The two things most responsible for making a business successful are the quality of its staff and controlling how work flows within its organization. This is key to what I'm doing right now. New technology enhancements are there. Everything is going good. We can get faster computers. We can get more storage. That's that's fine. But you really have to concentrate on achieving productivity gains with your people. A flow of how work is performed is easy enough to understand. The problem is that your most important asset is your people, and you're not utilizing them right. You have to implement business imperatives, costs are overrunning all the time, personal productivity is lacking. So how do we overcome some of these things? Well, with a workflow management. So we have a workflow management system, automated training system for people, and automated recruiting system. And I'll show you how that works. As work requests come in, they go through the workflow management system. And first thing it does is analyze the workload level. Is a person assigned more work than they can do? If it's Jess, and workload is too high, we need to get somebody else to get to help that person do his work. That may mean that we have to either recruit somebody or have that person, another person has been selected, trained to a higher level. So we would, and also for any newly recruited people, orientation and indoctrination has to be performed. So the automated training system would do that, even for a new work or a new tool. Then work would be assigned to a person. It would be logged in and assigned and tracked. It would move from one person to another. It would be prioritized on a work to do list. And how we do that is we would uh, assign work by due date and then a priority within that due date. So if a person went to his uh, work to do screen, he would see the most important piece of work that he has to do on the top of the screen and then progressively down for less important work. Uh, then we would charge back, in other words, we, we would see where the work is done so we can do a purchase order for the resource usage. We can have an audit trail of what activity. So with the audit trail, uh, we would know how work flows through your company. And with analysis and reporting, we can determine where we can improve efficiency. So again, automated personnel system goes into the workflow. It can be accessed through your intranet. 
And an automated training system can be in, introduced to it as well. And we can log, assign, track, measure, analyze, and report on work being performed. Now, forms, this training system here, a forms management system, also has the ability to help people achieve their career path goals. Uh, you submit a work order. The forms library is, helps you understand what form you need to submit for that work order. Uh, the forms fields would then all be created. It also have help associated with the screen and data entry validation for all the fields. A personnel matrix would be analyzed to determine who has the skill level to do the work. If they don't have the skill level, they can go, <clears throat> they can go through uh, training. Uh, and the training could also include certifications from vendors and accreditation from universities. So as they're being trained, you actually get a uh, better level of trained people. Now, if this doesn't help you retain people, I don't know what will. Hiring, you have a process of planning, projects and work requests, staffing requirements that fall out of that. The hiring manager is told to get staff, so he makes a staff request. It goes out to the human resources field. They come back with hits. It hits on a database or a file and sent back to the hiring manager. All of this can be done without any physical paper helping you achieve the green leads 100% category. So you'll benefit from it and your goals will be reduced cost, better staff, everybody happier, on and on. All right. Uh, one last thing I really wanted to show you uh, is listing of the industry standards. There's a whole bunch of standards out there. Now, I've had all these standards on my, my own particular data uh, website for quite a while. So this is the screen that you could see to actually pick on it from COZO, which is a risk management, COBIT, which is how you integrate business in IT, uh, Singapore standards, which are sometimes pretty hard uh, above and beyond some of the others. Dodd-Frank, if you want to see what Dodd-Frank's about, you can actually open it and see the whole narrative of the Dodd-Frank. Some of the other documents that are just as important are all of the FEMA NIST 800s. Everybody's talking about that. NFPA, National Fire Prevention 1600 Standards, uh, FFIEC, which is the old uh, standard for business continuity within uh, the world in the United States. And it's had three levels, business continuity, information security, and operations auditing. The new, new manual or the new standard is ISO 22313, and that's here, Sarbanes-Oxley, response uh, activity matrix, and SOX remediation document. Now also, here on my website, there are a bunch of other documents and stuff that you can always get to if you want. All right, now we're finished with a lot of that uh, what's required stuff. So in the first phase, we have the executive committee, and we have a form that lists everybody in the executive committee. I'm not going to go through all these forms. <laughs> uh, the needs analysis is the uh, the uh, technology risk assessment. The business plan and goal is that statement of work we talked about. Creating recovery teams, responsibilities assigned to them, it's fine. But we also have a project plan. So we developed a project plan for these three locations and for the proof of concept uh, up front. As you can see, they're all the same for each three locations. And then there's a training aspect at the end here. Uh, the infrastructure readiness is how I prepare the recovery site to accept applications for testing and for activation. The planning phase is the meetings that people attend. The pretest is how I actually, uh, we've already set up the environment for an application, but now the application is going to be tested. So the pretest people come in and reallocate the resources. And some of the things that they're doing in this case here is there's a site recovery manager, which is uh, a way of re replicating the production environment that the uh, user is in. That's loaded. 
then the RPA or recovery point applications data is synchronized. Uh, security is there and connectivity is there. So you're going to simply switch from a production IP address to a recovery IP address and the end user's switch to the recovery site is transparent, supposedly. The actual test, since you're in the recovery environment with your current environment replicated, you simply use your application runbook to go through an application test. So it's no change. You should be able to start up the application using the runbook, run the application. You should have all the messages and codes in your runbook, so you should be able to respond to any messages and so on and so forth. The post-test is after the test is done, uh, the disaster recovery coordinator will collect the worksheets from everybody. Now the worksheets are uh, a comparison of the actual time it took for somebody to do something as opposed to the estimated time. That deviation is, is written down. Also any problems that were encountered are listed and any comments that a person may have are listed as well. Those could be comments that would make an improvement, comments that recognize a problem we overlooked, and so on and so forth. All of that would then be created or be brought into a report and a presentation that will be delivered at a post-mortem meeting to executive management, and those people would make recommendations for improvement. Those recommendations that are selected will be added to the recovery process hopefully making the recovery process better. And by following this test, analyze, recover, you will then be able to build a better recovery process each time around, eventually achieving the best recovery process you can for your company. All right, so that's pretty much all done. The laws and compliance you've done, so we're getting close to where we're actually going to start seeing some things that are being helpful to us. All right. The business location recovery plan, I just want to show you this real quick. Now, uh, within this document, this is, again, another one of those uh, fill-in-the-blank type of documents. It does work. It's been proven in a major organization, and it has everything in it that you need. Uh, including how often the tests are done, um, what happens immediately, what happens over periods of time, uh, the general information that people are need. But the thing I wanted to point out, two things I want to point out is, number one, if you have a disaster normally and you have to evacuate your building, normally you'd go to a uh, an assembly point where a head count is taken and people wait further instruction from management. Now, recently, a friend of mine named Felix Nader has told me that that may not be the wisest thing to do because in today's terrorist-bound world, people are pretty smart. And what they would do sometimes or could do is to set off a distraction disaster event in your site, maybe making the microwave oven get on fire or whatever, okay? where you would have to evacuate your building, and he knows, or they know, of the assembly point you're going to go to. Well, prior to actually implementing this similar this simulated disaster, he could have planted explosives around that place. And when everybody comes there, boom, everybody's hurt. So this assembly point concept may have to be rethought so that you can then turn around and say, when everybody evacuates, they disperse, and they call a phone number to register their head count. And that might be a safer way of doing things, and especially in today's cell world and uh, mobile phone apps. Another thing I wanted to show you is that if you have an evacuation and you have to go to uh, a business recovery facility, it's really nice to have relocation information and instructions, such as driving instructions to get to the location. Again, in today's world, if you have the location address, you can provide it to people. They can put in, it into their own GPS environment, and they can get to the location from wherever they may be. Okay. Now, hopefully, that's the last document I'm going to take you through that gives you an understanding of how quickly we can get the documents. Now, what I'm going to oh, 
one more thing, sorry. <laughs> the DR management dashboard. <clears throat> now this is the executive management dashboard, but the DR dashboard as uh, is just for disaster recovery planning. It starts out with you know, what are the statements of work that made me get to this place, you know, project overview, so you can see what what the project looks like. Statement of work and so on like that. Uh, then you have training materials, so now people can get up to speed. And then you have presentation materials, which might help them as well. And then you have the DR exercise booklet. And in the exercise booklet, you'll see that we've broken down our recovery process into six cycles. First, it's recovery site infrastructure readiness, which I've told you about, so we can uh, make sure that the recovery site resources are allocated to this specific application or service that's being tested or activated. Then you have planning sessions, so that managers can get together and make sure they understand what direction they're taking and plan out the scope and deliverables for recovery tests. Then you have the pre-test where technicians at the recovery site set up the environment so that you can test uh, or activate your recovery. Then this actual test where you follow the instructions in a run book to absolutely test your recovery. Then there's a post-test and a post-mortem meeting in which a report and lessons learned are provided. That's a separate dashboard that uh, is devoted to recovery management. Dashboards like that would be provided for infrastructure, and for system development life cycle and also for compliance. All right, now this is the final step that we're going to go through. We're actually going to see what happens when a site disaster recovery occurs. The uh, disaster event occurs and uh, it turns out that the disaster event was a fire that was recognized in the break room. Uh, microwave oven burst on fire. Well, first of all, let me just show you that Site contactless has very many people involved. One of them could be uh, the business recovery site themselves. So you can see the people at the recovery site and who you have to call. Uh, it could be a vendor list, supply chain managers, because supply chain managers will have to be told, instead of having your uh, supplies delivered to the original site, deliver them to the new site. Now I'm going to go back to the plan again so you can see that that, that that information is there. And of course you can add information anytime you may want. Okay. So the event occurs. We declare a disaster. The recovery team leader is also notified and he, met, he notifies his team members. Then a primary site is evacuated under the control of the fire marshals who actually go out and make sure that people leave. Then all, everybody meets at an assembly point for a head count and uh oh there's a problem. What's found out is after the head count was found that two people were missing. That's going to cause an action item. Now the action item is actually generated by the person doing the work. Now if you clicked on that person, this is the information you get. Their name, company, their position, their phone number, their email, and uh, their IM address. That's the drill down to the direct person. Now the action items and then put into a list, and those, those items are going to be coordinated between the recovery team and the contingent command center, who in turn tells uh, executive management, who in turn tells the world. Uh, two people are missing from the head count. Uh, we're going to continue to look for them. We made sure that we talked to all the other people in the crowd, and people have said, yes, we saw them in this morning. I don't see them now. The command center is notified. We get, obtain instructions and management instructs personnel to go to a secondary site for further interviewing and or to continue work at the secondary site. That's going to be initiated. Then we go over and we talk to the first responders. We talk to the police department. Said, no, we didn't see anybody. We talk to the medical, emergency medical team. No, we didn't take anybody to the hospital. Then we talk to the fire department. They say, well, there's a lot of smoke in here. We may have missed somebody. So we're going to initiate a search again with special equipment. So they go back in and they start looking for the people again. The contingency command center, uh, we told them about the first responders and they're saying, well, let's hope that they, they can find somebody because man, we don't, we don't want to lose anybody in this, this incident. 
Well, finally, after a period of time, good news comes back to the fire department. They found the two people that were missing. They were found unconscious and suffering from smoke inhalation, but they're alive. So the emergency medical technicians come on site. They provide on-site uh, treatment, and then they rush the people to the hospital. Management notifies the families of the people who were injured, and they rush off to be alongside them by the hospital. Word comes back from the hospital that the two recovered people will make a full recovery and will be released from the hospital in a day or two. So everybody is very happy about that. In this case, management looks very good because they took the initiative and they actually located the people that are missing. So for the outside world, the company looks like a really good company to work for. They do care about that people. So now we're worried about going to the business recovery location. Now, as we're going to that particular point, the business recovery site is notified that we've declared a disaster and we want to go to the site. The business recovery site turns around and says, I'm sorry, we're full, because other companies have declared a disaster as well, and our first come, first serve policy is in effect. Uh-oh, action item number two. Now, the recovery site is full. What do we do? Uh, executive management makes a phone call pleading with the site. No, I'm sorry, we can't help you. We're filled. Uh, we'd love to help you, but we can't. Uh, personnel directed to go home and await further instruction while management determines how they can get a reciprocal location or rent space to put people in to continue their work. A busy. Okay, let's see. Um, okay. Personal direct management must notify clients now that, that uh, it's going to be limited service available. We have some overflow of work that we can send to other locations, but it certainly can't keep up with the volume of work. So we have to tell our clients that we're going to be able to provide them with some service, but it's not going to be at the level that we had before. Hence, we'll be violating the service contracts. Additionally, we could be violating some regulatory laws and regulations. We'll have to see how that goes. North of the site is finally located through a reciprocal agreement or a rental alternative. And clock is starting to tick, so people are starting to get over there and looking at the site. Unfortunately, the site does not have the resources that the original business recovery site had, so they have to be stocked. So we have to go out and order the equipment, get the equipment in, and it's going to take more time. You know we're, we're, ex we're going way past our recovery time objective anyhow. What is coming back from the salvage and restoration team that the primary site has been salvaged and restored and that it's ready uh, pretty much for investigation by management and then uh, returned by the staff. Well, this, the location passes management review, but the problem is the location is not included in our return plan. It's a new location, so we have to develop a new return plan. So the uh, Contingent Command Center and DR people get together and start doing that. The entire staff will return to the primary site and after, after this plan is approved and work starts to commence there. At this point, claims are coming in from a bunch of uh, customers about our uh, service level slippage and also the regulators are calling at the gate too. But we're going to put that aside right now because we have, we have to really recover our plan and get back to business. So of course, post-mortem is conducted. We find out where our failures were, and we make corrective action. And then finally, management speaks to the employees to thank them for their efforts. The media is briefed, and the clients are fully informed of both the failures encountered and the progress that will be made in the future to eliminate further failures. In this case, management didn't look as good as they did the first time. But at least they did have a clear disclosure based on facts, which is always good for everybody to have. Now, supply chain vendors were notified to go to the secondary site at first and then back to the recovery site, go back to the production site. Recovery team is back and everybody's working. Now, a status log is also maintained of all the activities, what the status was, who the owner was, and what happened. All right, so now you've seen pretty much an entire recovery process and what is involved with it, and you've also seen how quickly 
the use of dashboards can help you achieve what it is that you want in a much faster and more accurate way. All right, now let's get back to Okay. All right. Questions and answers. I know there's probably a bunch of them now. I don't know what we have down here, but the entire audience. Okay. Uh, all right, everybody, uh, if you have a question or an answer, or you need an answer to a question, you can simply forward it to me at bronacht at dcag.com, and I will respond to you. Also, what's the next step? Well, if you believe that the approach that I've mentioned here can help your company improve performance and bring products and services to market more rapidly, then contact me at my information right here. I would love to assist you in integrating this approach within your environment. Remember, this approach uses your existing data, so you do not have to change information to adapt to this product. This product can adapt to you. If you need any of the information contained with this, within this presentation or that I have available, that's up for purchase as well, and it can certainly help you achieve your goals faster. I want to thank everybody for your time and patience, and I appreciate your attending this meeting. I am going to end it now and respond to questions as they come in to me. Thanks, everybody, and have a really, really good day. Bye now. Cool.